Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our skills workshop uh, webinar series. And we're really excited to have you, have you here today. And we've got an exciting, exciting workshop um, uh, a panel a webinar for you. And uh, you'll be quite excited. But the first thing I want to introduce you to um, is uh, our uh, Miss Holly uh, to De Silva the executive director of the BSCP for just a welcome to this event. I'll turn it over to you, Holly. Thank you, Raphael. Um, I want again, good evening and thank you for joining us. This is for the 2021 Skills Workshop webinar series. As Raphael mentioned, I'm Holly De Silvia, executive director of the Biomedical Science Careers Program, better known as BSCP. Tonight is the first webinar in our eight part series that will take place throughout the month of October. This series will focus on applying for and succeeding in college. The Skills Workshop webinar series was created to address the needs of underrepresented minority and disadvantaged high school and college students by providing concrete information on the skills needed for success in their academic career. Webinar subject topics will include those addressed during the traditional in-person program and also information that students and their parents have indicated that they need now. Future session topics throughout the month include getting into health professional and graduate schools, financing in your, your education, community college pathways, interviewing skills, tips for resume and cover letter, and internships and summer opportunities. There will be a special session for parents and caregivers, and the series will culminate with a virtual internship fair, which is a new addition this year. This program is co-sponsored by the Harvard Medical School Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, or DICP, and BSCP. Now we're gonna take a moment and review a few disclaimer and housekeeping items. All lines are muted and the chat function has been disabled. Please use the Q&A tab in your webinar panel to communicate. And it's important to note that this information is accurate as of October, 2021, and as such is subject to change. This information is for personal use only, please do not distribute. And the recordings of the webinar will be available on both the BSCP and BICP websites. Each participant and attending this evening will receive a supplemental packet of information emailed to the address in which you registered for the session by the end of the day tomorrow. And lastly, we'd be most grateful if you would stick around to take the poll questions at the end of the program. And now I'd like to hand it back to Dr. Rafael Luna. We're so pleased to have him here as moderator this evening. Dr. Luna is the Associate Dean at Boston College's Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences and director of both the Pre-Health Program and the Gateway Scholars Program in STEM at Boston College. Dr. Luna is a member of the BSCP Board of Directors and a former BSCP participant. We're so happy to have him here to moderate the session today. Dr. Luna. Oh, thank you, Holly. Thank you so very much. And yes, I'm very excited to be here and we can't wait to answer some of your questions or, and also we wanna answer questions that are relevant to you. We do have some pre, uh, some questions sent over to us ahead of time. And so we want to um, be mindful of that, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we answer any questions. If you hear something from a panelist say, wow, this is great. Go ahead and send that question to us. So that way we might be able to incorporate that as we move along from topic to topic. Does that sound good for everyone? So this is a, a contact uh, interaction sport, you know, as you will, like this is your career. And so, you know, if, since it's your career at BSCP, then you don't wanna be on the sidelines. You wanna be actively engaged. You wanna be in, you know, in the sport, in the arena and in the game, uh, thinking what's best for you. So this is a time to really think, what can you do for yourself and how to get these experts uh, these uh, experts, these national experts to really help you really kind of fashion and think of what you want to do and how you want to do it and who you want to become. And a lot of these questions, you know, just see what it, what you can do and benefit so that um, because you being successful will make a difference even for your own family and for your friends and your community, right? So, so by you thinking about what can you do to get better for you, it also improves others around you. So with that, you know, then we'll, you know, uh, move to introduce our panelists. And uh, what they're gonna do is introduce themselves and give a fun fact. Uh, one of my fun facts is, you know, I, I love salsa music. So, and uh, my daughter just moved off to college and she's like, dad, get back to dancing more salsa when I'm gone. And so that's my, my fun fact in the list and the to-do list for my daughter for me to go out and dance more salsa. So uh, with that, we'll bring up our first panelist. 
uh, is Stephen Abbott, Associate Director of Admissions, Coordinator of Native Indigenous Outreach, LLC Fellow at Dartmouth. Uh, Stephen, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and an interesting fun fact as well. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thanks, uh, Ralph. Uh, real pleasure to be back with all of you again and looking forward to a great evening and all of your questions and hoping to pass on some good information. Uh, again, I work up here at Dartmouth College and I serve as Associate Director of Admissions. Um, I've been in College Access Arena for a very long time, probably most of the, longer than a lot of our uh, attendees tonight have been, been alive, um, but have worked at a bunch of different places over the years, a bunch of different colleges and universities, as well as um, the Gates Millennium Scholars Program. And uh, always a, really appreciate events like this and the opportunity to pass on some information and hopefully pull the curtain back a little bit on um, this process. So uh, I uh, also serve as the live-in advisor for our Native American house uh, here on campus at Dartmouth. So get to work with students both coming in and here on campus. Uh, fun fact, I travel an insane amount, uh, usually when COVID is not around. And um, so I was actually just talking with uh, some of our students. I started tracking my travels over the years and realized I've been to all 50 states at least six different times, so. Wow, all 50 states at least six times. Wow, that's an incredible fun fact. Wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, now, our next uh, panelist is uh, Julia Esquivel, um, Associate Director of College Counseling at the Milton Academy. Good evening, everyone. I'm also really excited to be here. Um, my name is Julia Esquivel. I am in my sixth year as a college counselor at Milton Academy. Um, that is a uh, independent school that is half for day students, half for boarding students right outside of Boston. Um, prior to that, I was actually uh, born and raised in central Massachusetts. Uh, I was the first in my family to attend college. I went to Vassar College, just a small liberal arts school outside of New York City. Um, and there I met um, admission officers and realized I wanted to do what they did because they were really instrumental in helping me navigate the college process, which I knew nothing about from my high school or my family background. Um, I worked in admissions for Haverford College, the small liberal arts school outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and then I went and got my master's in public health at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, and while I was at Emory, I also read applications for their admission office. Um, I did about four years in the world of public health and I missed admissions and educational access so much that I took a job here at Milton. Um, and basically my role is sort of um, sort of like a gu guidance counselor. I'm a high school counselor. So I help uh, students apply to colleges and help them figure out what they're looking for and what their fits might be. So my fun fact is, um, you can't see me now, but I'm all of 4'11". Um, uh, and I am a competitive eater and I've never lost a competitive eating competition before. And it's uh, pretty fun when people see my size and think I can't, I can't win, but I've never lost. Wow, what a great fun fact. The, uh, yeah, I, uh, my mother always thought that I, I'm 6'5", so she always thought that I was a competitive eater, but I'm sure you can eat me under the table, so I would not go against you because I, you know, uh, I, I trust you, you would probably beat me. So uh, that's a really cool fun fact. That's awesome. Uh, thanks for sharing, Julia. Uh, next. Our next panelist is uh, Jennifer uh, Schoen, um, Director of Opportunity Scholarship and Outreach Programs at Northeastern University. Great, well, hi everybody. And congratulations for being here and spending time to learn more about the college and financial aid admissions process. Uh, you know, pat yourself on the back for, for spending time doing that when I'm sure there, there's some other fun things that you might like to do. So I hope we can make this fun for you. Um, my name is Jennifer Schoen, you can call me Jen um, or Miss Jen, depending on where you're from. Uh, I work at Northeastern University in Boston, and I work with uh, Boston Scholars and the Torch Scholars, uh, who are all receiving some spectacular financial aid uh, to come to Northeastern. And what I do in my office staff do is to make sure that these students who are mostly first generation students from low income backgrounds, uh, take advantage of everything that the college has to offer. 
Uh, as for me, I went to a small liberal arts school, Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania, and I've worked in admissions and orientation and career development and residence life at in Pennsylvania, in Vermont, uh, in New Hampshire, now in Boston, and for 20 years out in Washington State at the University of Washington and Pacific Lutheran. So I've uh, been at lots of different schools doing uh, who, who excel at many different things. So I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today and hopefully answer all the questions that you're just going to throw at us. Um, my fun fact is I actually have a podcast called Your Keys to College, where uh, my college roommate, who is a school counselor, and I uh, just talk about some things we think students and parents should know about college and college admissions. So that's that's it for me. Wow, we have a celebrity here with the podcast. That's great. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, if, um, that's great. If you could share some of that information with Holly, um, that might be something that could be shared with our, our constituents as well. Thanks for sharing. That's a great, that must be so fun doing a podcast. Wow. <laughs> so talented group here. Uh, next we have is Ariana Williams, admissions officer at Harvard College Admissions and at Financial Aid um, at Harvard College. Uh, Ariana, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I must say, it's a, it's a tough act to follow all these amazing fun facts. What a cool group we have. Um, but just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, my name's Ariana Williams. I work at Harvard College in the admissions office. This is my third year in the office. Um, I grew up in Jamaica Plain, so right here in Boston. I actually went to Milton, so it's fun to share the floor with Julia tonight. Um, and actually, my dad just ended his tenure at Muhlenberg, Jen, so I was shocked to hear you say that. We'll have to chat about that later. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in JP, went to Milton, um, and then made my way to Wash U in St. Louis for undergrad. I um, worked in that admissions office for about three years and made my way here a little ways after that. Um, so it's fun for me to be back home. In terms of my fun fact, man, I really have to go through um, my list of fun facts to keep up with you all. Um, I guess the fun fact I'll, I'll attempt to use is that I did ballet for much of my childhood and actually was Clara in the Urban Nutcracker, um, which is still a, a local Nutcracker production. So I would recommend if you haven't seen Urban Nutcracker, um, go see it. And I, I, you can imagine me as Clara when I was eight or nine. So, uh, so yeah, that's my fun fact. Wow. So we do have more than one celebrity here. That's awesome on this panel. Um, wow. I'm, I am humbled being around all of you panelists. And now what we're going to do is discuss some questions when, um, that were sent to us before. And but please uh, continue on submitting from the audience, submitting your questions and that'll, they'll get to us. Um, so make sure you fire away. And so, but the first discussion topic, you know, we'll go to Stephen Abbott and, and we're gonna, this, this part of the discussion is really, how do students find su uh, support systems and navigate a predominantly white campus? Um, and how does one succeed in college? That's like a big, big topic. But could you break it down for someone that's never been through this before and um, and kind of help them out? And then we'll go into more, take a deeper dive afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks very much. And, and uh, as you say, this is a huge, uh, huge topic and I'm sure there's a lot of different suggestions out there. So I would just kind of prime the pump with a couple of different suggestions. First one is very small, but it always helps to know kind of what you're walking into. So really thinking about, you know, everything is relative in a lot of ways. So I think about when I worked at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, um, you know, if for students who are coming from Southwest and from downtown Detroit, where they were used to seeing, you know, uh, the population was 90 to 95% African American and Mexican American, to step onto a campus like uh, Michigan, where there was only about 40% people of color, was a huge culture shock. And yet people who are coming from some of the suburbs, where it was exactly the opposite, it was really refreshing to see how many, you know, uh, people of color there were. So really helps to kind of do a little bit of, of just research, understanding, you know, what is this campus environment going to be like? If you have the opportunity, it's always tough, uh, particularly in these COVID times, to spend time on the campuses that you're interested in, get a sense of what you're in for. That can, all, uh, you know, always help mitigate the um, kind of that culture shock uh, on those uh, those first few weeks and, and you know, adju um, adjusting to your campus. But um, obviously, you know, seeking out the resources that are available to you and talking to, you know, representatives, uh, it, 
preferably multiple people if you can, you know, talking to folks in the admissions office, certainly, but also getting a chance to talk to students uh, and other people. And um, I always encourage people not just to ask kind of basic questions, but really don't be afraid to push back on some of these topics too, because uh, the reality is, you know, everybody's trying to diversify their campus. Everybody wants to see, um, you know, students from all different uh, demographics and walks of life. And real talk, I mean, some places are much more kind of ethical in, in communicating an authentic experience to you than others. And, um, you know, some people will promise the sun, the moon and the stars and tell you whatever you want to hear. And, you know, others will give you a little bit more of the kind of the genuine picture. But, you know, really where the rubber meets the road is asking about how, you know, uh, people are doing. So one of the frustrations I know I run into a lot is some of the institutions that boast about having really, really large indigenous or native student populations also have horrible graduation rates, you know? So it's like, oh, we have 1200 native students on campus. It's like, yeah, but you're only graduating 30% of them. So what does that say about, you know, what kind of experience people are having? So take the time to really kind of push back on those, um, some of those, those inquiries as you're deciding where you want to apply and ultimately, of course, where you want to go. The other thing too is um, to find out the resources that are available on campus um, and also make sure that you're, you're kind of crossing the threshold and using those resources because a lot of the higher ed data will show that you know people are often aware of the resources on their campus but they don't actually utilize them. Those resources are there for a reason and whether it's academic support, whether it's cultural support, whatever it might be um, that you're really seeking out, um, that's, you know, a big part of what you're paying for, you know, whether you're on financial aid or whether you're, you know, um, paying part of your tuition, all of your tuition, whatever, you know, these resources are there and they're designed to help you be successful. And so it's really, really important to take the, the step to actualize, you know, um, your use of those, uh, of those resources. And you will find, you know, that particularly in making that shift from high school to college, it is the students that are utilizing the resources, the advisors, the tutors, the mental health um, counselors, you know, all those different resources that are the ones that are successful. Those aren't the students that are struggling. And the reason they're not struggling is because they're using those resources. Um, <clears throat> probably the most important single thing about when you're transitioning into a college environment is really learning how to self-advocate as well. So when you don't know, ask if there's something you need and it's not there, push back and, and you know, you have the right to be there. You have the right to expect that your needs are gonna be met as a, as a student. And too often people put themselves in a situation where they diminish their own voices. So that ability to self-advocate and reach out for what you need and what, you, um, what you're worth uh, is really, really important. And I would also say be patient, you know, in finding your community because some of the best supports that you're going to find are going to come from your peers, from your friends. And sometimes it takes a little while, you know, to get involved in different things and find, you know, find where that, um, where that family, where that resonant group is going to be for you. So, you know, give yourself a little time. But um, ultimately, most people uh, can trace their success in higher ed back to one person, uh, that one person that's your ally. And it might be a best friend, it might be a counselor, it might be a faculty member, it might be somebody that works in the dining hall, it might be the janitor that cleans in your dorm, somebody that believes in you and really makes that investment in you and helps you reach your full potential. And that support can, can really come from anywhere. So um, those are some of the things I would share to really try to help um, you know, um, navigate some of those campus environments as you step onto them, but I would throw it open for um, other suggestions as well. Wow, that, that's great, um, Stephen. And, uh... And you mentioned that one person ally. I remember Dr. Mildred Smalley in chemistry after my, my third college, she was the one that says, hey, you can do this. And I was like, well, I'm going back home to, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be able to make this. And so, you know, and you brought me back there 30 years ago, Stephen, you know, and, and, you know, and also like, as you know, we hear from others, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with our, our, a new generation of students and, you know, some of them, you know, are making decisions for the first time. And it seems like really big decision. And, you know, like, am I qualified? You know, who decides? And, you know, and, uh, you know, how do they go through this decision-making process? So, Steve, I just want to ask a follow-up question. How, you know, how do these students go through the decision-making process that they're doing what's in their best interest? You know, can you just comment on that? And then we'll open it up for everyone else. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great question. And I think it's it's a very important question. And it's it's something that will evolve with you, I think, because it is part of that self-advocacy is also self-awareness and self-actualization and realizing what you need and what you want to do. Um, I think a lot of times people really tie their college education to a career. 
Um, and, you know, hopefully one of the things that we can talk more about tonight, too, is uh, the value that education has in finding out what those steps might be. And, you know, when we go through panels like this, we'll often ask people, like, how many people are in a, a career that you went to undergraduate for? And many of us aren't, you know, um, and so this is a path that's going to continue to unfold in front of you. And so um, I think the one of the, the secrets and one of the most direct answers to your question is really not trying to make all those decisions at once, um, but also kind of letting your path unfold seeing the opportunities that are in front of you um, and then just trying to stay stay real to yourself because I think it's very easy as you change into these environments to get subsumed by everything that's going on around you and feeling like you have to change um, and you do want to change and you do want to grow but your values and your core self and everything else that you believe in and where you're from um, that is not something you should ever have to compromise for for anybody in any situation yeah that's great uh, Julia we like to add on to uh, some of Stephen's comments and your thoughts as well on, on this topic of how do students find support systems and navigate a predominantly white campus and how does one succeed in college and make these in these decisions which seem like they're big decisions and they're all on their own how do they you know like it's impacting them how do they go through that a lot of what Stephen said is so, so true and totally nail on the head. Um, we always, I always tell my students is definitely find your people on campus. Um, that'll also be really helpful for you determining, are you a good fit for the college? Is the college a good fit for you? Um, one of my favorite quotes is by uh, Carmen Lopez, who's the executive director of College Horizons, who says, maybe it's not that you're not ready for college, but colleges aren't ready for you. Um, and so a lot of what Stephen said is true. It can often be a large culture shock uh, for students when they do enter that four-year institution. And so never worrying alone is really important to find those people. And you can actually start to find those people in the admissions process. And that will be a good gauge about whether you feel like that might be a place you want to spend the next four years of your life. Uh, the better you get at practicing those self-advocacy skills in the admissions process, the easier it's going to feel when you get to colleges. Um, and oftentimes, those admissions people might be your people. They were mine for me. Um, I would not have gotten through my four years of college without the multicultural recruiters that I had met that told me to apply to college. I really didn't think I was going to go. Um, and I'm still in touch with them today. They really helped me sort of get through my four years, I had a really hard time adjusting academically um, and socially to, to my college, even though it wasn't all that different from where I grew up. Um, so really trying to be sure that you're uh, leveraging those resources. Uh, one of my favorite stories is um, I had a student who finally decided to go check out the Academic Skills Center, right? Every college has something like that. Um, it's a place where you can go to get help with your writing or homework, time management. Um, and when they walked into that center, they were like, oh, wow, all the smart people are here. <laughs> um, so it, it, it just goes to show you that the people who can really uh, leverage those resources are, are going to get through those four years um, uh, or more in, in a more successful manner. Um, and I'll tell you a secret, a lot of students, um, especially students coming from my school, they've been taught that for a long, long time. So it's, it's a skill that they arrive with, which the average person does not arrive with. So do not be intimidated by the ease that students might have when they're asking professors questions or stopping by their office hours, um, things like that. Uh, they were once also uh, probably afraid to ask questions and know how to ask questions, but they just do, and no one should give you a hard time for that. Um, and, and also important is to really, as, as Stephen said, is to really believe in yourself and, and know that you were admitted for a reason. Um, it is not a mistake that happens. Trust me, I wish those happened all the time as a college counselor, but um, you deserve to be there, and honestly, the college would not admit you if they didn't think that you would thrive there. Um, it, it, they do ethically think about um, if, the, if this is going to be a place that you could do really well, not just do. Um, so really just sort of repeating a lot of what, what Stephen is saying. Um, pay attention to those metrics too, just like Stephen said, the graduation rates. What are the resources on campus? Like, do they have a center for BIPOC students? Or maybe it's uh, they have 
multiple centers for different demographics. Look at the mission statement of their uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice uh, departments and or initiatives. Um, read the student newspaper. Those are available online for everyone to read. Um, and in the age of COVID, honestly, sometimes social media um, in, in, in the right doses helps you understand what are students really talking about and how do students really feel? Are they actually supported here? Um, unfortunately, it, it is up to you to sort of do that piece because it is true a lot of colleges will sort of, uh, you know, say they're working on things and, and, and things are getting better and they probably are, but they still not might be ready for you. Great, great point, Julia. I think we found hearing that theme of finding your people, finding your family, but I love the never worry alone, leverage your resources and believe in yourself. Um, uh, Jen, would you like to add to this uh, topic before uh, we move on? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm gonna just echo very briefly what everyone else is saying. And, and I think the most important thing is to ask questions and ask for help. Uh, if, if you do that, and if you can start to do that now in high school, where you go to your guidance office and you say, hey, I need some help with the college process, or you ask a friend, uh, let's do this together, because I'm not sure, and the power of two, right? You can do, you can both do research and find what you need to do, or ask a teacher, because they've all been through college. You know, ask questions, and, and don't be shy about asking questions, and that, that one skill will take you far, and Bob, that's all I'm going to add to that for now. Great. Uh, Ariana, can you also briefly comment on this? Uh, I love the buddy system, Jen. That's a great point. Uh, uh, how do you kind of make it through this transition, um, Ariana? Yeah, um, so so I, I too echo everything that my colleagues have said. Um, I think one thing that, that we've been talking around that we haven't actually named yet is the idea of imposter syndrome, which is the idea of, of thinking about, you know, oh, do I really belong here? Maybe I shouldn't be here. Am I as good as everyone else here who seems to know what they're doing? We've talked, we talked about it. Um, but but that's the term that we're, we're talking about when we talk about that. Um, and for, for one reason or another, I think everybody when they get onto a college campus has a moment or many moments of imposter syndrome. So, you know, maybe it's in terms of academics, maybe it's in terms of socially making new friends, maybe it's in terms of being in a new city or a new state or a new country for the first time. Um, so everybody that's going to college is going through some sort of a transition that's new or that they're not exactly sure about. And the, the more that you can start to have those conversations with your peers, the less alone you feel in that. Um, and so more that you can break down those boundaries with, with other people in their first year is going to help you to realize, oh, I'm not the only one who feels totally lost in this class. Or I'm not the only one who doesn't know how to do laundry or who doesn't know what office hours are. And I need to ask, you know, what even is an office hour and why would I go there? Um, so as much as you can acknowledge that everybody else is having their version of imposter syndrome too. Um, and, and like Julia said, the idea of, you know, in admissions, we're not making mistakes. We're admitting people on purpose intentionally. We're having rigorous conversations about each person and, and why they would be successful on our campuses. Um, so, so please go into it with confidence that, yeah, I, I belong here. People believed in me. People think I can be successful. Um, I can start to think that I'm going to be successful too. And the way that you do that is by reaching out to the resources that we already talked about and, and thinking critically about which campus might have the best resources for you to be successful in that way. Oh, thanks so much, Ariana. And, and yes, um, you know, mentioning the imposter syndrome and if you belong and, you know, it seems like everyone else knows uh, everything except for you maybe at times. And that could be kind of difficult for students. And you might even feel that in high school at times, like how does everyone else know how to do all this and apply to college? And, you know, how do they know what to expect? So um, the, uh, so Julie, I'll turn it back to you. You know, how do students prepare for college and what to expect? Um, and how do they know if a school's right for them? So if you're here, you're already doing it. Uh, you are definitely preparing yourself. Um, so here's a secret that I'm pretty sure everyone else that's a panelist would agree with. There is no magic formula for who is the best looking student to get admitted to the hardest colleges to get into. Um, there is sort of a secret, which is that it's 
the best way to do that is to be your authentic self. Um, so as you're researching colleges, this is actually a really good time to start. We start with our students in the second semester of their junior year. This is not something you had to be doing in the womb. Um, but you are still uh, figuring out what you're interested in, what do you like. Um, so I really like to think of the college process as a part of self-exploration. So when you frame it that way and not about, you know, what are the admission stats here? And what about this selected school here? Think about what, it, what you really care about, what makes you tick, and how you want to optimize that, and then do that for your college research. Um, so in terms of what you're doing in high school, um, really what you should be doing is selecting courses that feel appropriately challenging for you. Um, great that all of you have an interest in STEM. I will be honest, math was terrible for me. I was not about to take honors or AP math in my high school. Um, but if your high school does offer uh, courses that you're interested in, along with the appropriate rigor for something that will challenge you, but not, you know, make you drown in homework at night and cry and start to dislike that subject very much, um, start to curate your own sort of high school experience that will uh, show your strengths as well as your interests. Granted, it's high school, you don't have a lot of choice here. Uh, please also know that all of the college admissions um, professionals, they actually know about your specific context. So if your high school doesn't have AP courses or it might not have honors courses or it might not have multivariable calculus or something like that, you are not disadvantaged in the process. You are being evaluated for what your high school could offer you. Um, that being said, it will take a little self-advocacy on your part. Um, I, at my school, I have 40 students that I get to work with for a year and a half. At most high schools, that's not the case. Um, so your ability to get to know your guidance counselor or high school counselor might be limited. Don't worry about that. Just make sure that you are working with somebody to be able to pick the right courses for you. Um, somebody had mentioned in the Q&A that what are those courses? Um, a lot of the uh, college professionals will, will tell you as well as sort of what they're looking for. But since a lot of you are interested in STEM and pre-health, it's probably a good idea that you stick with the sciences and the math. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in being pre-med and you decided not to take biology at your high school, then you're gonna have to learn a lot of biology in, in college. So um, be asking the different schools that you're looking for in terms of um, what majors and schools they have within the university, how to best sort of uh, prepare yourself in terms of the classes you would take in high school. You will likely need to retake a lot of that subject matter, but it shows that you are ready and interested in, in those uh, potential majors as well. Um, testing is a hot issue right now, and I think really we're all probably collectively rolling our eyes. Um, to me, one of the wonderful silver linings of the pandemic is that we are seeing most schools go test optional um, or test free. Um, so just, you just want to be paying attention to that, but I can tell you that for all the schools that are on this panel, as well as many schools that practice what's called holistic review, um, the test score, if they do require one or look at it, is just a very small part of the evaluation of, of your, uh, your application. Um, I'm sure we could we can chat more about that at some point, but uh, know that the SAT or the ACT is not a great metric of your intelligence or your preparation, um, and colleges know that. So we're having uh, more nuanced conversations about testing. It's not necessarily true that you have to get the highest score to be considered and be uh, be competitive at the most selective schools. Um, also outside of high school, you really just want to be, my best advice to you honestly is just being your authentic self. Um, so fill your time with what you can do and what actually interests you. Um, I, I've seen students who have resumes that look like they're the leader of every single club and cured cancer and all these things. And there's just no passion behind it. And honestly, they, don't, they sometimes get waitlisted at the schools that are on this panel rather than a student who maybe does an after-school job uh, to support their family. They might have familial responsibilities. That means that they can't play soccer. 
Um, so really fill your time with, with whatever you have, um, doing something that's meaningful to you. Um, so whether it, or not you think you need to be a national honor society or on a three sport athlete or something, that's all a myth. You should just be who you are and show that uh, it's really quality over quantity um, and whatever you're doing is meaningful to you. And if you don't have time to do those things, Colleges will know that, and you should write about that in your application. Um, most schools use what's called the common application. You'll get about 10 spaces to list your activities. You don't need to fill all 10 spaces to be a competitive applicant, uh, but that's a great place for you to let uh, college reps know, like, hey, you know, I, I work 25 hours a week, or I have a really long commute to school, so I'm only able to do X, Y, and Z. Um, it's very clear your engagement with those um, activities or extracurricula. So um, as long as that comes through loud and clear, that's a great way to sort of sort of tell colleges who you are and sort of um, be as sort of interesting as you can in the in the college process. Again, you're only as interesting as you are authentic. Um, so that's sort of uh, the what you could be doing in high school. And then in terms of your research, I, I know that we are limited in a time of COVID in that um, you're not able to maybe visit college campuses. Uh, let's be honest, the average student does not visit their college campus. They do not get on a plane, they do not get to go. Um, so colleges are doing their very best right now anyways to try to engage you, um, specifically for um, many of the colleges that are on this panel, as well as uh, some other colleges, they offer something called uh, fly-in programs, and even if you're not getting on a plane, it might not be a, something you fly to, but they tend to be admissions programs uh, for underrepresented students on their campus, so that might be first-generation college students. Um, it might be transgender, gender not conforming college students. It could be BIPOC students. Um, so join the mailing list of schools that you're interested in because you might get an invitation to go on one of those. Often the college will also pay for your travel expenses. A lot of them are virtual now, but that is a great space even virtually to get to know about those other pieces of the college that Steven and Ariana and Jen were talking about is you usually get to talk to students who are there and have a frank conversation with them about what's good here, what's not so good here. Um, so the programs are usually really helpful for you understanding the vibe of the school um, as long as um, on top of the resources you might get as well. Um, I mentioned before that social media and uh, checking out student newspapers is really helpful. That will let you know what are students talking about, what do they think, what is sort of some of the collective values of the school. Um, so that will also help you research um, sort of what does it feel like to be there. And then since a lot of you are really interested in, in STEM programming, you wanna make sure that the resources are, are matching you. So how many students um, you know, get to do undergraduate research? What does undergraduate research look like? What's the access to those? What are the access to internships and networks? Um, these are all questions that colleges anticipate you asking. So they likely come up in either virtual information sessions or in-person information sessions. Um, again, another silver lining from uh, the pandemic is that a lot of these information sessions are now at your fingertips, just like what you're doing right now. Um, and so attending those is a really good way for you to get some information about certain programs at the school, as well as understand some things about um, social life as well. Um, so those are some sort of basic tips for uh, preparing yourself and then researching colleges. Um, the application process, um, is is uh, can be can be grueling and can be totally manageable at the same time. Um, so many schools are on the common application. It's one platform that you send your application to pretty much probably most of your schools. There are some other schools that use different platforms um, or their own school platform. But suffice to say, you're going to be doing a lot of writing when it comes to applying to college. Um, so you will usually submit one essay. It's, uh, the common application has one essay and then some other platforms as well. And that's about 650 words of any topic of your choice. And it's your chance to sort of say something about yourself that you feel is really important to colleges. Um, and then many colleges um, will have what's called supplemental essays. So that means that you um, will write anywhere from one extra small essay to 12 short answer essays. 
Um, so it's a lot to stay on top of. So I would suggest that when it comes time to think about where you're applying and when you're researching, start with a spreadsheet and just list every metric that matters to you. Um, you know, list the requirements of the schools and whatnot. And then you'll start to see who has overlap with uh, certain uh, requirements, who is similar to other, one, other schools. Um, I really like using the BISC guide um, uh, for researching colleges because my favorite part of that is they have an overlap section. So, oh, you really like Northeastern, uh, but maybe you're looking for a school that's a little less selected than Northeastern to be sure you have a balanced list of schools that are probably uh, very, very selective and schools that are a little less selective. Um, so maybe you find out, oh, there's another uh, co-op program at a place called Drexel that admits you know, this many students. So um, this, is a, this guy is a really good place uh, to start as well. Um, and then I'm a big fan of College Greenlight. They will list pretty much um, all the fly-in programs that I just spoke about as well. And they're a good, um, search engine that is that are it is based in sort of um, equity and access. Um, and so you can get some information there as to sort of admission chances and then some basic information on the colleges that will lead you to uh, better websites. So super long answer for preparing and researching for colleges, um, but that's basically the gist of it. Oh, great. Thank you, uh, Julia. That, that was great. That was very informative and really helpful information. And so um, I just want to open us up to the panelists. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you want to add anything else to that as well. Any specific thoughts? Ariana, let's go for it. Let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, no, I think Julie did a great job. Um, you know, this is what she does day to day. So she's she's the main person. Um, the only thing I will add is I feel like one of the things that was nerve wracking for me in the process was thinking about like, what does it mean that is a right fit, right? I was very nervous about like, choosing the wrong place and having a miserable experience. Um, and now looking back, you know, I think so much of college is what you make of it, right? Like a lot of the, I mean, certainly all the institutions on this call, many institutions are wonderful places. And like, if you find the people, as we talked about earlier, like you can create a safe, supportive, exciting space for you. So like, ultimately I think, you have control over that once you get to a college, right? So, so hopefully that like makes you feel a little bit better. Um, but then the other thing I think that was helpful for me is um, ultimately the way that I decided for a college was really like the vibe that I felt at a particular school. It wasn't stats, it wasn't majors, it wasn't numbers. It was just like, I feel like I could be happy here. That's really what it came down to. I feel like I could make friends here. I feel like I could be myself and be comfortable on this campus. Um, as Julia said, you know, it's harder to get that vibe if you're not able to go visit campuses right now. Um, a lot of schools are offering like virtual tours or like virtual ways to connect with students. And so you can have like a grab bag lunch virtually, or you can have like interactions with students where able to have dialogues or able to sort of get somewhat of an idea of what it feels like to be a student there. Um, I That's always my favorite question that students ask in online information sessions that we host. So we have information sessions that are like an hour long, just talking about Harvard. So if you want like a lot of information about particular schools, they have their own information sessions. But one of the my favorite questions in that is like, what is the general vibe on campus? Is it competitive? Like, do students go out into Boston? Like, just what is the general vibe? Because I think that will be really helpful for you to understand. I sort of think of it like almost like a wedding dress feeling like, oh, I found the one. Like, that's how it felt for me is as this, I can just see it. I can see it um, and see myself comfortable here. So as much as you can try to ask questions or curate a situation to where you will get at that question of what's the general vibe? What does it feel like? Um, so much of college is not class. Um, it's very different than high school in that way, where in high school, it's like you're in classes from, you know, 7.30, oh my gosh, or eight, all the way to three. And like, maybe you have a free period or, or maybe you don't. And that's like your whole day. And then either you go to a job or you go home or you play a sport or like just your whole day is taken care of. But in college, you might have one class 
from three to 4.30. And like what you decide to do with your time beyond that is up to you. Maybe you're in a place where it's really easy for you to go into the city, or maybe you want to be in a place where you can like be in your dorm and have these like philosophical conversations with the people around you till three in the morning. Or maybe you want to be close to the beach, like whatever it is that you want to be spending your time doing outside of the classroom. There's so much more of that time in college. So think about like, what is that outside of the classroom experience going to feel like for you at a particular school and try to ask questions that will get at that. Great, great. And just, and we're loving the questions that are coming in. They're pouring in and our panelists are typing away. And, um, and so we want to keep, continue that flow. Feel free to keep sending your questions in. Don't feel like you have to wait to the end of the session, to ask your questions, ask them along and keep sending it to us. And we'll either type it or address it. Um, and now, but yeah. And so uh, now we turn it over to Steven to add a little bit more to this. Great. Thank you very much. And, and, um, huge echoes to, to both of our co-panelists here. Um, and I just wanted to add or emphasize one thing that I think as, as important as it is to recognize that um, that fit really comes from a gut feeling. Um, it, it, I also wanna get back to one of the things Julia had mentioned too, that you know, ultimately uh, this is about kind of generating and curating a list of schools that are gonna be a good fit uh, for you. And I think one of the things that um, often happens is that sometimes people get really set on one institution, in particular, if you're looking at competitive schools, um, you know, if that one institution doesn't work out, that shouldn't be the end of your, you know, your search. There are literally almost 4,000 colleges and accredited colleges and universities in the United States alone. Um, so you have a really broad swath of institutions that are going to meet your needs and be great places for you. So it's not, you know, I always tell people, you know, college is not true love. There's not just one person out there for you. There are probably dozens, if not hundreds of different good options um, to think about. And in terms of thinking about that list, you know, if you can make sure that you have one, you know, what you might call like an anchor school on that list, you know, something, someplace that you are fairly confident, if not absolutely rock solid, sure, you are going to get into that, you know, would be a good fit for you. Um, and as long as you have that school, then you're going to be in good shape. Because, even, you know, if you ask yourself that question, if this is the only school I get into, am I actually going to enjoy going here? Um, that can be a really great guide through this process. And the other thing coming from a highly selective institution too, that I would point out is that if you are looking at those more selective schools, and remember when we talk about all this pressure on, you know, college admissions and college applications and all that kind of stuff, that's really at the end of the day, only about 10% of the colleges and universities out there fall into that really competitive category. So, um, so you, you know, think, you know, think carefully uh, about the types of schools that you're looking at. Um, but coming from one of those schools, if that is a school, you know, those types of schools are of interest to you. If things don't work out at those schools, please don't ever let that reflect on you um, because it is not a reflection of you or how well you think, you know, you will do in college. Um, as admissions officers, we get our hearts broken every single year, many, many, many times over because there are so many students we go to bat for that we simply don't have space for. It's not that you're not amazing. It's not that you're not qualified. It's not that you can't do it. It's just we only have so much space and we have to choose between literally thousands of amazingly talented people from all over the world. So um, don't ever let that reflect on your goals because I hear people say, well, I guess I wasn't good enough to get in there. And that has absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever. This is not about, um, you know, anything, any reflection on you as a, as a person, but more power to those schools that are going to reach out and make a place for you um, in their communities because they're seeing that value in you. Uh, I love that, Stephen. More than just one for your two love match. Maybe there's one, tens and hundreds. Look at that. All you students, you have hundreds of schools you can fall in love with and um, and then you can narrow it down to the right one. Once you get your, your, those acceptances, then you can pick which one do I wanna to go to? And we've seen questions in the chat about, you know, financial aid, and we're gonna talk about that coming up in one, in one of the discussion points. So we're gonna, I wanna table that conversation about financial aid, but there's state school culture and fit. There's so many different things, just like in true love, you, you got so many things you need to match, right? And so there's gonna be, have to be a good match for you and for them as well, for the university. And our panelists mentioned that um, as well. So this is uh, really exciting. I, I do wanna turn this over to, to Jen for our next topic um which is talk about financial aid look how appropriate we, we're transitioning right into that so um 
how to navigate the financial aid process, uh, how to apply for scholarships and deal with debt in college and post-college. Um, and then also, if you can address a little bit, there was a question in the chat that I did promise that we we're gonna discuss is that, you know, what do you expect in your first year of attending college? So maybe you could talk about the financial aid process of like, if maybe as a high schooler going through the process and then maybe all the way ending to you in your first year, how do you keep that financial aid machine going to keep getting more scholarships? And, and what do you expect, you know, and it's new, I'm the first of my family to go to college. What, what, what does that even mean? And it's scary. So how do we de-stress de uh, and take that scare away? Yeah, I mean, I, I think talking financial aid is one of, one of the things you have to sit down with as a family and, and talk about at some part in the process. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about financial aid, but you know, for me, I did not, I got into my first choice college, but when we sat down and talked to my family um, and we tried to look at all the offers that I had, it came down to uh, one college, Muhlenberg, gave me a better offer than my first choice did. So I ended up going to Muhlenberg. And then just like Ariana said, you make it what you want it to be. And obviously I had such a good time. I'm still working in a college, right? So, so college was so great. I'm still in college basically. So the very, the number one thing that you can do, the most important thing that you can do when it comes time, which is pretty much right now if you're a senior, but early in the fall of your senior year is fill out the FAFSA. Everything or nearly everything with financial aid comes from the FAFSA. And FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid, though nobody calls it that, it's always the FAFSA. Um, if you are a senior and you go online right now and you go to the FAFSA and they're saying like, hey, for $50, like you're in the wrong place because the first app stands for free. So you want to make sure you're at FAFSA.gov, which is the free site for you to fill out your aid. And this is something, again, you're going to want to sit down with your family, with your parents, with your guardians, um, and you're going to want to have some things together before you sit down to do that, you know, have have some taxes ready just and then start the process. Everyone will tell you that it's not like a fun thing. It's not exciting. Um, but if you think about it as this is what's going to get me scholarships. This is what's going to put me in the pool for grants from the from the institutions I'm applying to. Then I think it does become a little bit more exciting because it's a way for you to tell the institution like, hey, I'm I'm in, I'm interested in you, and I would love for you to consider me for financial aid. So everything starts with the FAFSA. Um, and the other thing I would encourage you to do is to get it in before January of your senior year. So your senior year, it, it opens early in the fall, get it in by January 1st. And the reason I say that is because colleges, what they do is they look at the, the basic is, and I know it's a lot of acronyms. So you have the FAFSA, right? You fill out the FAFSA and that tells the college, here's what your family can be expected to contribute towards your college education, which is your expected family contribution or EFC. So Whatever college you go to, your EFC is the same. So if you go to a school that is, I'm just going to make up some numbers here, like $25,000 and your EFC is $5,000, then they're going to put together a financial aid package of $20,000. If the school is $70,000 and your EFC is the same, it's $5,000, they're going to put together a package that's $65,000, if I did that math right, um, $65,000. So you're gonna get a much better aid package maybe from a school that's more expensive. Now, a lot goes into that aid package. There's grants and scholarships and those are the, that's the money that you want. And so you wanna apply early because that's the money that runs out first when the colleges are giving you their financial aid. When they're sitting down and filling it out and giving you the money, they always start with grants and scholarships. Then it will go to loans. And so if you get it in late and all the grants and scholarship funding is gone, then you're likely to get more loans. So hit those priority deadlines for the colleges you're going for, or just say to yourself, 
I'm going to get it in as soon as I can, even before the holiday season, so that while everyone is freaking out over the FAFSA, I've already got it done and I'm just sitting back and waiting uh, for those financial aid offers to come in. So that's, like I said, that's exactly where you wanna start. And if you have questions about the FAFSA, there are some great resources um, that you can use. You can call the college uh, financial aid where you're applying and say, hey, I have a question about FAFSA. How do I fit this if this is my situation? Because there's so many different situations out there. And as we asked and we talked about before, asking questions is key. And it's the same for when it comes time to fill out the FAFSA. Ask folks for help. Um, so we talked about grants, we talked about scholarships, we talked a little bit about loans, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But besides what the college itself will give you for scholarships, um, there are also lots of other places you can look for scholarships. So uh, I know, I think uh, Julia already mentioned College Greenlight. Um, excellent place to start a, a scholarship search, especially if you're a first generation student. Um, because they have some wonderful resources there. There are also some really um, robust and large college search engines like fastweb.com, like Scholarship Owl, um, where you can also look for different scholarships. But one tip, and I heard this from a student who ran a program um, that's still around, it's called Scholarship Junkies, uh, and they will help you with your scholarship applications totally free. Um, and what he did, and he got tons and tons of scholarship, he went to his high school guidance office um, and he looked, they had a book uh, at, his, at his high school. So he went through the book and anything that he was remotely uh, eligible for, he applied for. He sent essays out to everybody. He, he applied for every single thing he could think of, um, including ones, he was, he was a guy, there was a Girl Scout, uh, application he applied for that because of how it was described he's like it doesn't say you have to specifically be a girl so i'm applying for that too and he actually got that one anyway he applied for all the scholarships that he could find at his school and then what he did was he looked at his rival high schools online scholarships that were listed and he applied for them too because he went to a school that wasn't as affluent as this other rival school. And so they had a lot of different scholarships that were offered to their students. And again, wasn't specific to their students, anybody could apply. So he basically stole uh, some scholarships uh, from, the other, from the other school. So look around for scholarships. There are many out there. Some are really big, you know, we'll, we'll pay tuition room and board and books. Um, others may be for $500. And you may say like, oh man, I have to write like a, a thousand word essay for, for $500. You know, that's, if that takes you like two hours to, to write that and refine it and review it, you know, that's $250 an hour, pretty good deal there. Um, and that will absolutely cover like books for one, one or two semesters. So every little bit that you can get and earn in terms of scholarships, is absolutely worthwhile. Um, the other thing I would say is talk to people about the fact that you're gonna to go to college. Say, I'm going to college, I'm looking for scholarships because when you talk to people, then they start to listen more because now they know somebody's looking for college. And they're like, oh, you know, I just heard about a scholarship where I work. You might wanna think about that. Or, you know, maybe the place where your parents work um, uh, or your guardians work have scholarships that are available to, to the children of the people who work there. So start to put that out there, um, that you're going to college, that you're looking for scholarships and let people know about that. Um, and people are be, most people are really willing to help you and will kind of keep their ear out uh, for things that, that you can find to, uh, that you can find to apply to. Um, like I said, talk to scholars, talk to the admissions counselors at the schools you're applying to and ask them just right out, right? What scholarships do you have for people like me? Um, and see what they tell you. Um, and ask questions about, am I required to write an extra essay for that? Do I need to get nominated for that? Or do I just submit my application and am I automatically considered for that? Um, and the answer, you would get maybe get multiple answers. You know, at Northeastern, you're automatically considered for lots of scholarships based on the application you send in. But we also have some that you need to be nominated by your guidance counselor 
or you need to be nominated uh, you know, by anyone who's an adult who's not related to you, um, who can write about your challenges and strengths. That's for the Torch Scholarship. So lots and lots of different ways that colleges look uh, to award scholarships. So again, I, I keep saying this, I feel I'm very repetitive. Ask questions, ask questions. Um, and then I think the other thing you wanna do is find out if a college covers full need. All right, that's a really important question to ask. And now what does that mean? So again, I talked about the expected family contribution and if you can afford $5,000 and the school costs $70,000, if they cover your full need, it means they will give you a financial aid package that covers that full $70,000. And it, can, it might be grants and scholarships, it could be loans, it could be work study. Some colleges do not meet your full need. So you have that $5,000 place costs $70,000. They may give you $60,000 in financial aid. So you have to come up with that other $5,000 some other way. And so knowing if a college cover, covers full need is very important. And that should just be like an automatic question that you, sh you should ask, do you cover full need? Um, and then, you know, when it comes time for accepting um, your financial aid package, and you will, for, for most of the time, you'll be able to compare all the aid packages that you get before you make your decision. When you sit down and you sit down with your family and you decide what's right for you, it is perfectly okay to consider finances and financial aid as part of your decision. Uh, it doesn't have to be the whole thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, what, what breaks it, but it should be something that you want to talk about because you don't want to leave college so overwhelmed with debt um, that, you know, all you can think about is I need to get a high paying job anywhere, anytime, right away, just so I can pay off my debt. When you get loans, it's not like, you know, somebody says, hey, here's money. Good luck. Bye. You know, they will talk to you about what a loan is. How do you take it out? When do you start paying it back? Um, a lot of schools have, you know, videos you have to go to, or you have to go to a class. You actually have to sit down, maybe not in the COVID times, but you sit down and you go through a program that says, here's how your loan works. What's a subsidized loan? What's an unsubsidized loan? Why are they different? Um, just so you know, subsidized loan means the federal government is paying your interest while you're in school. So it's not accruing any money. So you take out $5,000. When you leave six months after your college graduation, you start to pay off $5,000. If you have an unsubsidized loan, you take out $5,000. But then when you graduate, that has been accruing interest. And so maybe you owe $6,000 by the time you have to start paying off your loan. Now, I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying things, but I just, I want to, it's, it is complicated, um, but if you take it sort of one step at a time, starting with the FAFSA, and then starting to look for scholarships at some of those you know, great search engines that you can use, um, just go to town and just be ready to write uh, a lot of essays to get some of the scholarships. Um, remember, you're not in this alone. Financial aid counselors, the schools you're looking for, there's all kinds of organizations around, um, especially in the Boston area. You Aspire is one um, that will have special financial aid days for you to ask questions. Um, even FAFSA has a hotline you can call. Um, so there's lots of different ways for you to get the information you need. So hopefully I answered some of your questions. Um, I'm sure I may have left a lot more questions, um, but hope my colleagues, I'm sure, uh, can, can chip in with some, some other thoughts and some other ideas on financial aid. Oh, thanks, Jen. You did a, you did a great job, Jen. Um, just want to hear from uh, you and others on the panel. You know, we, we, you know, the financial aid process, you mentioned it's a family decision, right? And so what if, you know, you're, you're being raised by a single mom? Or if your dad or your mom, one of your parents don't work, you know, or you live with your abuela, your grandmother, you know, how it gets complicated. So which documents do you need to get and how, what do you need to do to even apply for that FAFSA, which is for uh, federal financial aid? But then also what's the difference between that and the college school board? 
Like I, my, I just went through this with my daughter. She applied for financial aid, but then all of a sudden getting emails from the college school board. Hey dad, you need, uh, you need this information. I'm like, I gave it to him on fab. So are you guys talking to each other? How come I got to do this two or three times? Why am I doing this? And my daughter's like, dad, leave me alone. I'm figuring out myself, you know, but you know, can we talk about at that kitchen table, you know, at dinner, like, you know, whose information do they need to collect? Who, where do we send it? Um, and when, you know, like, can we just talk about at that dinner table, like, who do we need to get and strategize to be, you know, whose information do we need? Um, and where the students still in control of where they need to go and how they want to get there. That's just for everyone. So anyone feel free to chime in. Yeah, well, I, I would say, you know, start by like looking at the FAFSA and, and walking through it and, and seeing the kinds of things you're going to need. If you go to the FAFSA site, it will give you some information on like, here's what you need to do to get ready. But there are some really tricky situations. Like what if you're living with one parent um, but your other parent makes more money, like do you have to include them and what their income is? Um, what if you are in foster care? Like how do you then fill it out because you don't have family to fill it out with you. It's just you filling it out. There are a lot of complicated questions and that's when you wanna sit down and go through it, write down all the questions that you have and then make that call, sit down with someone you know, connect with someone to, to, to walk you through those questions. You know, you can go as far as you think you can and then be like, oh, wow, I've, I've hit this barrier. Don't let that barrier stop you. Just let it be a pause while you find out the information that, that you need. Um, and if you don't know, start with the admissions counselor who goes to your high school and say like, hey, I need to talk to somebody about financial aid. Who do you know? Um, because at some schools, there, there's like a buddy system. So like I have somebody that's my buddy and I call them in financial aid when I have these questions that I can't answer that are just complicated and then I connect them to the student and so they have that conversation. So, you know, so there's sometimes you need to call in the experts and financial aid is one of those things. And, and luckily for us, we have a financial aid expert on the panel, another one besides Jen, we have Ariana. So can you mention, you know, how does a student, a high school student, never been to college and their parents may or may not have been to college, they might be first gen, how do you have these conversations and, you know, maybe they've never even talked about money at, at home in the house or how much your mom makes. And when I remember learning what my mom made growing up, she made 18000 a year. I'm like, how do you pay for all this with that 18000 She's like, yeah, we stretch it out and you eat a lot of food. And so like, uh, and so Ariana, how do you, how do these students kind of take control of this narrative and and have these conversations and just even getting prepared so they can apply for this FAFSA. And, and there's so many questions. Yeah, I get it. Lots of questions. Um, yeah, I, I am just laughing at that conversation with your mom and, and Julia is about being competitive eater. That's, that's great. Um, so I also have buddies in the financial aid office. So I don't work directly with financial aid. I have friends and colleagues that work in that office where when students have questions for me, I just direct them right over to the financial aid office. Something that we've been working a lot with families on right now is that a lot of families' financial situation looks different because of COVID than it did two years ago, right? Um, so trying to figure out what, um, what that expected family contribution is in reality now based off of current situational things as it relates to, to finances for a particular family um, might be more of a conversation, right? Might be more of a conversation than just using your tax returns from two years ago because now it's a completely different story and you don't work where you used to or you know both of your parents got laid off or, or took on multiple jobs or whatever it is. Um, that's why we have financial aid offices, right? Because we want to understand what a full situation is. For example, if you have um, schools that meet full financial aid, what that means is they're wanting to understand what your family's full financial picture is. So you can have those conversations with the financial aid offices, with your family to, to start that and say, oh, I'm confused because 
what we have to write down on this form is actually different than what's going on right now? Or how is that going to change when my little brother, who's two years younger than me, is also going to be in college? Like, how will that impact our family's financial situation? So um, there are counselors and, and officers that work on this all the time. Um, so they're a great, a great place to start. Um, but starting to have those conversations with your family, I think as you're starting to look at colleges is a great, great way to not have any surprises later on um, down the line so that everybody's on the same page going into this process. Thanks so much. You know, and then like to love to hear from Julie on this perspective, um, because I'm sure you're working with students and they're probably asking all these questions like what, what I need to do next and you know, you know, and uh, Jen mentioned, try to get in by January. And they were like, oh my gosh, it's October. And, you know, where do I get all this information? And, you know, how do I, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? And I would love to hear from Steven as well on how to have that family uh, conversation as well afterwards. Sure. Um, and, and Raphael, you might've gone through this, but the, uh, Financial aid process can be a bonding experience. Um, so you might be uh, more aware of your folks' uh, finances or your family's finances, or your family might be more aware, but if you work together, you can usually get everything you need to complete your FAFSA. Um, and also it's been thrown out there, there's a, another document for financial aid that um, uh, many private schools, mostly uh, private colleges use um, called the CSS profile or the profile. Um, it is done through college board. So if you took an SAT or plan to, uh, that's the same folks there. Um, they ask a lot of questions on the CSS profile, um, but I promise you it's all in good faith. Um, sort of what Jen said earlier about scholarships, it could take you a long time to fill out the CSS profile, um, but if that, at the end of the day, that means that the college, if they have the CSS profile require that of you, it means they have their own institutional funds for financial aid on top of federal aid. So it's often that you will likely get more money um, if you fill out the CSS profile. So maybe you lost a couple hours of your life with, with uh, the people in your house, but maybe you got $45,000 out of that. So um, it, is, it is good to have a family conversation too, because um, I don't know, I still don't know my parents' finances. Um, so it is good to know what is realistic. Um, a good way to also determine that is most schools, most colleges have what's called a net price calculator on their websites. Um, and it's not a perfect tool, but it can give you, it'll ask you a few basic questions um, and it can, it can give you a ballpark about what you might be expected to pay at that college. Um, I also, uh, what Jen was saying about asking questions, my favorite people honestly are often financial aid officers. Uh, they are also not just there for prospective students. When you are enrolled in a college, the financial aid officers are the same ones that deal with you for your entire time. Um, so it's also important to note that the Office of Financial Aid, while it might be connected to admissions, is not related. So in, a, in that way where like, let's say you're afraid, most of my students are afraid of calling the Office of Financial Aid to ask a question because they're afraid, oh, Ariana Williams is gonna know that I called and asked maybe a stupid question and I'm not gonna get into Harvard or something. No, not at all. Whoever you talk to at Harvard's financial aid office is probably never going to tell Ariana about that. Um, so it's really important that uh, you do feel comfortable and know that you should feel comfortable when you do contact offices of financial aid. That can be before you apply. They are truly staffed with some of the most patient, kind, knowledgeable people I've ever encountered in the admissions world. Um, and if they can't give you an uh, answer, they will direct you to good resources. MIFA is one we use with our students a lot as well, on top of the other ones Jen had mentioned. Um, and uh, MIFA, Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, they will actually get on the phone with you and help walk you through the process um, as well. They also do it in other languages. Um, so there's a few ways you can gather information, but um, once you're in college, you will continue to work with that Office of Financial Aid. So it's good to familiarize yourself with, with the office, with the people, never be afraid to ask some questions when you're a prospective student and maybe when you're an admitted applicant as well. 
when you're trying to understand your financial aid package, it is well within your right and you should pick up the phone and talk to one of the financial aid counselors and they can help you understand your package as well. Oh, great. And then also, um, Stephen, can you just mention briefly, like, I know we, we have another topic we wanna to touch base, but just briefly that uh, from culturally, how do you have these conversations about financial aid? You know, in like 30 seconds to a minute, <laughs> yeah, um, no, it's a, a great question. And I think I would really echo uh, one of the things that Julia said um, in particular, which is that there's a lot of invasive questions that go into this this process. And it's important to kind of um, be aware of, you know, just again, eyes open going into the process. And a lot of times families are like, whoa, why do they want to know this? Why do they need to know that? You know, all that kind of stuff. And so that can be very difficult. Remember, financial aid is a conversation with your institution as well as with your family. So, um, you know, if, if aid is not meeting your need, go back to them and tell them that. Um, that, you know, they can often adjust packages. They can help you find additional uh, additional loans and stuff or additional um, scholarships and, and, you know, information like that. So um, I think it's very, you know, very important, but I think the single most important thing I would share about financial aid is to remember, I mean, speaking, got both Harvard and Dartmouth here right now, which are literally two of the most expensive institutions on paper, you know, in the country right now. Um, one of my favorite maxims about financial aid is it can be cheaper to go to a more expensive school. And I will say that again, because it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but it can actually cost you and your family less money to go to what looks like a more expensive institution on paper because of the availability of financial aid. So a lot of students that come to these types of schools that are upwards of $70,000 a year on paper are actually paying less than they would pay to go to community college, let alone in-state public tuition. So that's a really, 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 really important part of that family conversation. So my advice to people is never, ever look away from a school because it looks too expensive on paper, because until you have that financial aid award letter in hand, you have no idea what that institution is actually going to cost you and your family. So um, it's really, really important to not, you know, start crossing those uh, schools off your list because they will often be some of the best sources of aid. Yeah. And, and thanks so much, Stephen. And, and also, this is such a great discussion. But it doesn't have to end here because guess what? We, on October 14th, there's a finance webinar. So stay tuned and please register for that one and also be there for that. Uh, well, further ado, I want to bring it over to Ariana before uh, we end up closing with an uh, elevator pitch from everyone. Um, you know, just, you know, you know, we had a question about AP exams. How does that factor into the, the decisions? And, and if you can touch base on about you know, challenges that some students may express uh, impact, you know, that may impact their academic success, you know, you know, the isms like racism, sexism, negative signals on campus, um, and how to get involved on campus, is, and is that important? Those are some big questions, but, you know, just if you could share any thoughts that just come to the top of your mind, please. Sure. Um, so, so I'll I'll attack each one. So, in terms of APs, Julia mentioned earlier, um, we look at you in the context of your school, right? So, some schools might not even offer APs. Maybe your school has honors. Maybe your school does IB. Maybe your school has none of those things. We will know that from looking at what we get. Um, something called a high school profile. So that will be written by people like Julia who work on the high school side, who tell us, you know, this is what was required of students to graduate. This is the classes that we had offered to our students and your transcript tells us what you decided to take. So as Julia mentioned, you know, if you have APs or honors or, you know, challenging courses available to you that you feel like will be a, a good way for you to challenge yourself academically um, to the right extent, right? Don't overdo it, but do it to the extent that you're excited to do it. Um, that's great. But also if your school doesn't offer that, that's great. Um, some schools do dual enrollment. Some schools do any number of different types of ways to give students a more challenging academic curriculum. Um, so whatever it is that your school has, you have access to, go with that. There's no advantage like AP over honors, over IB or dual enrollment's the best, nothing like that. We're looking at you in the context of your school. In terms of joining student organizations, clubs, getting involved on campus, definitely do it. That's like the most fun part of college. Um, that's, that's really where you're going to make the most memories and, and make the best friends. Like that, that is for sure what you should be doing when you get to college. There are 
hundreds and hundreds of different groups, like every college will have an activities fair where you have, you know, many, many different options and tons of things you've never heard of. You can do things that you've done in high school or also like try something completely new. One of my favorite things at Harvard is we have an inner tube water polo team. So like, if you want to play water polo, but you're not so keen on the treading water part, like that's a great option. Um, so all kinds of fun things to do. Um, some that can be more like pre-professional that might help you get an internship or a job after you graduate, um, but some that are just like really just for fun and trying to make friends and de-stress outside the classroom and anywhere in between. Um, and to your last point in terms of working through challenges that may impact academic success, um, I think this is really where those groups come into play, right? So building your support system, your network, your having peers help you through those times. Um, that's why they become important beyond just it's fun to hang out and do fun things is like, there's gonna be tough stuff that you experience in college. And it's really important then to have a group of people that you can go to. There are usually a bunch of student groups that talk through subjects that might come up such as racism or sexism or negative things that happen on college campuses um, that you can get trained and having conversations with other students who might experience that. There are usually like reporting systems for bias and where you could report things anonymously or, you know, work with your professors or advisors to end up doing something about a situation that happens to you in particular. Maybe it's something that's been a pattern that needs to be addressed by the administration. So um, having a support system with you to help you through those and to coach you and just chat with you about how to go about doing that is so, so integral. Um, and that's those two kind of go hand in hand. You can start doing that by joining organizations and clubs and building that network such that when those things happen, you have people who are championing around you. That's great. Thanks so much. This is so exciting. And now we get into the part where we're these expert panelists and these national experts get to share, you know, synthesize what they've been sharing, receiving the questions and what comes to mind. What is like a takeaway and, you know, just a, a short takeaway that you can share with others, um, like 30 seconds to a minute. Like, what is it that um, you would like to share? And and first we'll go with uh, Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think uh, there's um, so many different, you know, things that we could say. And obviously, we've been throwing information at you all night long. I think the uh, kind of what I would summarize really is is um, to be proactive and own this process. This is your journey. Uh, I think it sometimes gets so overwhelming that, you know, it's very easy to sit back and just let this process happen to you. And yet, you know, these are amazing opportunities that are in front of you. And uh, again, it's not just a tie to a job, but there's so many things that can, uh, so many good things that can come out of this for you. So own the process and remember that in, in the college access arena, the application is your story and just do justice to that story. Um, you guys have amazing stories to share and amazing people. So don't worry about what you think schools want to hear. That's really not the point. The point is to share who you are, what you are, what you're about. So um, own the process, own your story, and you're not going to go wrong. Great. that Own your story and tell your story. That's that's wonderful. Um, yes. And uh now we could go to, to Julia. Can you give 30 seconds to a minute? Just um, final takeaways. Sure. Um, I uh, often, uh, what happens on my side of the desk, as we call it in, in college admissions, is um, a lot of students get a little uh, caught up in the, not the right metrics for determining where they want to spend their college years and what might be the best fit for them. So I really like the phrase that a, uh, admission to college is a match to be made, not a prize to be won. Um, just because the school is very, very selective or you've heard of it before does not mean that's the most successful, most smart, uh, most interesting students out there. Um, it's, it's not commensurate with one another. So try to be very uh, clear with yourself about what it is you're looking for. And if you do what Steven says, which is just showing up as your authentic self in the process, you should find a really good match for yourself. Wonderful. Being your authentic self, this is wonderful. Feeling so inspired. Uh, Jen, can you share some thoughts as well? This is so great. Yeah, I think admissions at its simplest 
is trying to answer two questions. Can you thrive academically at our institution? And we look at your, your transcript and the courses you're taking. So you want to set a good foundation while you're in college and take classes that challenge you. The other question we're trying to ask is what will you bring to our campus? How will you contribute to the campus community? And that's when we look at your recommendations, your activity list, your essay. So authenticity is really important. If you share, if you discover things that, that make you excited um, in your activities, if you write an essay that is your authentic self, and which is here's something that is really meaningful to me that I'm gonna to contribute to your community um, and you don't write it the night before, um, it will come out and really share something important and it will it, and it will read that way. If you write something like, here's what I think admissions wants to hear, it is flat. We can tell. You may say like, oh, you're reading thousands of essays. Trust me, we can tell. Always pick something that really means something to you and share that with us because that's the best part of the application. Like, yeah, transcripts. Yeah, I got to look at that. Ooh, ooh, essay. That's the best part. So take your time and really think about what it is you want to share there. Oh, great. Indeed. And I agree. I leave the essay for last is my favorite part. Um, but but what I will I will end with is is just saying something that that we've said all night, which is that you're not alone in this process. You have so many people who are here to help you, who are wanting to answer your questions, who want to give you more information about the types of institutions that they represent. Um, so if you remember anything, it's that you can feel free to reach out with any of your remaining questions. If you forget everything that we said, um, feel brave enough to reach out, whether it's over email, um, whether it's by attending more of these sessions. Um, you know, there are so many ways to get your, your questions answered and there are people who want to help you with this process because we know it can be confusing and, and we don't want it to be. Um, so as much as, as much as we can support you, um, we wanna be doing that. Uh, th thank you all. Um, and I, this has been such a great night, you know, and we're just so thankful for um, the uh, everyone here tonight. But we also want to celebrate you, the audience as well, um, because you're here on a Tuesday evening. You know, you're in high school, you're taking these STEM courses, you got high school, you got clubs, you got activities. You know, you have dinner with the family. You know, you could make me start talking about financial aid. And so I want to applaud you for doing that. And so, uh, and also the, the panelists, they were just amazing as well. I learned something uh, from each and one of each one of the panelists. They were wonderful. And, um, and, and, and also like, you know, what I think some of the takeaways that we're listening from everyone is that, you know, be your authentic self of, you know, in, in college, you know, it might sound kind of scary because you've never been there, but there's also an excitement to that, like an adventure going on, you know, like going on a, a ride, you know, like, you know, never going to somewhere exploring, right? And so, you know, you might want to trigger some of that in your mind to explore and to and to do um, uh, what, what's best for you. And there's so many ways to do it. And there's not one answer fits all for everyone. And so, so really excited. Um, and I would like to turn this over to uh, uh, Dr. Joan Reed, um, as uh, you know, she's the professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's a dean for diversity and community partnership at Harvard Medical School, and she's the president chair of biomedical science careers program. And even more important than all those titles, she cares about each and one of you. This is her life's work: is to help you be successful. So, without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Reed. I thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Dr. Luna. I want to thank you. I want to thank all the panelists for giving your time, for sharing your wonderful insights and information, uh, for helping people to think about ways in which they can be successful as they move forward. Uh, such an, an informative evening. Thank you to all who came to the session. So for the panelists, but also for those of you who took the time to, to to take care of yourself um, and to think about your future tonight. So all of you, and a special shout out to the staff of BSCP who pull all of this together seamlessly behind the scenes. You don't always see the faces, but they're always working hard. You know, the, 
this session was recorded, this webinar, and it's going to be posted on both the BSCP and the DICP websites. I'm from the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School, DICP. A packet of supplemental documents is going to be mailed to the address where you registered. And so you'll get it, be getting some documents from us. And there's some upcoming webinars that you saw on a slide, and you can register at www.bscp.org to participate. Um, and at the end of this, there is going to be a short poll, some questions, very, very short, very, very brief, but it really helps us to understand if this worked or didn't work or what you want. Um, so before you log off, please take the poll. You can see it up on the screen right now. Again, I thank all of you for being here tonight, and particularly our panelists and Raphael for your leadership. I don't know if Raphael told you that, that um, he's been involved with BSCP for such a long time and in so many ways and serves on our board and is a real leader in terms of these efforts here um, and, and, and other things he does in his life. So again, thank you.